Welcome to the Alternative Watchtower Study. I'm going to be covering Article 11. The link in, will be in the description. You can click it and read the article if you want to, but I'm gonna jump right into paragraph one. This paragraph is talking about how they are truly blessed to be a part of Jehovah's organization during the last days. And that Jehovah provides them with a united spiritual family of brothers and sisters. He helps them to have strong family bonds. And he gives them the insight and wisdom they need to have true inner peace. I would say, well, are they truly blessed being a part of Jehovah's organization? The organization that will shun you if you disagree? The same organization that will let members die over refusal for a blood transfusion? The same organization that is currently in court in Montana fighting for their right to withhold information regarding the case. Does Jehovah really help families have strong bonds? Because mine broke in an instant. The moment I decided not to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore, everybody stopped talking to me. Does that sound like a strong family bond? Moving on to paragraph two. In this paragraph, it sets up the framework for normal feelings when it comes to our faith and how Watchtower and Jehovah's Organization is the answer to alleviate those feelings. Anybody can say the same things and replace the wording and it will click. I'm actually reading a book right now entitled The Four Agreements. Thank you for all of your suggestions because this book is pretty good. But in that book, it talks about the same types of things, our shortcomings and how to overcome them. And that book is based on the ancient Toltec teaching. So why is Watchtower acting as a spiritual life coach, printing out common sense? If you need character help or you have a personality disorder, then you need professional help. But what this watchtower is doing is literally giving you common sense points on how to help with your life in a, in a spiritual sense. In paragraph four, it talks about the apostle Paul. They are talking about Paul before he became Paul. So he was still called Saul. And so in this paragraph, they are talking about how Paul knew that the brothers and sisters were imperfect. Um, for example, he was misjudged soon after he started to associate with the congregation. And then they put Acts chapter 9 and verse 26. When I went to those scriptures and I started reading it, I said to myself, do you really think he was misjudged? Because at that time, he was still Saul, who everybody knew to be persecuting Christians and looking for them to, to kill them and to arrest them. So in my opinion, it was caution because Saul persecuted Christians. I don't think that they really misjudged him. I don't know. I mean, I would say something more to the effect of maybe they were just have, they just have heightened caution when it came around somebody who they knew to be looking for Christians to arrest them. And this is why context matters. Saul was hiding away from a murder plot from the Jews in that scripture when you read a little bit into that chapter here's a screenshot that i have for context about second corinthians 10 10 because they put this scripture after the sentence where it says later some spoke about him behind his back to damage his reputation so i asked my search engine to give me the context of second corinthians 10 10 and this is what it says the context of second corinthians 10 10 lies within paul's defense of his apostolic authority in this passage, he addresses criticism about his communication style. Some people claim that his letters were weighty and forceful, but in person, he was unimpressive and his speaking amounted to nothing. Paul emphasizes that true impact goes beyond mere appearances, highlighting the power of his written words despite any perceived weakness in his physical presence. So I see what Watchtower is doing here, trying to use these examples to um, to point out how you can persevere just like Paul did when these things were happening to him. But I think Paul's situation is very unique and needs to be taken very seriously in the context in which they are trying to, to talk about. Because in the next sentence, it says that Paul saw a responsible brother make a wrong decision that might have stumbled others in Galatians 2.11. When you look at the New World Translation, it gives the name Cephas. But as you know, I have an Orthodox study Bible. And so I went to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 and verse 12. And this is what it reads in the Orthodox study Bible. It says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. 
For before certain men, he came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the footnote reads, for verse 11, no individual apostle or bishop or patriarch is infallible. Even when he speaks officially, he is correctable. Unchecked, Peter could have caused a schism. So the Watchtower doesn't really go into those details and it doesn't even name the responsible brother in this article, which I don't know why. But this is a really great scripture because this shows us even somebody like Peter can be corrected. Yes, it was wrong. And in Galatians, this is what Paul is writing about, that he himself checked Peter when he was in the wrong. Now try checking an elder when he gets something wrong at your local kingdom hall or start questioning the governing body and see how far you get when you start questioning these people who are supposed to be giving us our spiritual food at the right time. Because in my opinion, Watchtower and the governing body would be getting multiple letters from Paul if Paul were alive today. In fact, I think Paul would write the letter saying you need to shut down because what you're doing is completely wrong. And then the last experience that they give for Paul was um, described in Acts chapter 15, verse 37 and 38. But the sentence here in the paragraph says, and one of Paul's close companions, Mark, greatly disappointed him. Paul could have allowed any one of these situations to cause him to refuse to associate with the offenders. Yet he maintained a positive view of his brothers and sisters and remained active in Jehovah's service. Okay, half of that is true. But if we find out what did Mark do, how did Mark disappoint him? And then, you know, that was the reason why Paul and Barnabas had the argument that they had. Sure, this was a bad situation, but I think Paul was correct in his discernment in not wanting Mark to come with them again. I think he was acting with common sense because he didn't want Mark at that time to to go with them because he deserted them. And that's understandable. So sure, he was mad at him for the time being, but he didn't suck it up and go with him anyways. They literally parted ways and he picked Silas. Okay, so I think that Paul is, is a great example. And sure, this paragraph is half right when it says that this could have, you know, um, stumbled even Paul. And that he persevered despite all of these things happening because later on he had a favorable view on Mark. But for the time being... Paul said what he said and he meant what he said, okay? So let's not get that twisted. In paragraph five, they want you to read Colossians 3, verse 13 and 14. And I'm gonna read it from the New World Translation. It says, continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely, even if anyone has cause for complaints against another. Just as Jehovah freely forgave you, you must also do the same. But besides all these things, close yourselves with love, for it is a perfect bond of union. Now I'm going to go to the Orthodox Study Bible, and I'm going to read the same scripture. So in Colossians 3, verse 13, and it says, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, why do they take Christ out of this scripture i wouldn't know but for some reason they replace the word christ with jehovah and i think that's just a little piece of information that i think you should know in paragraph six this sentence really got me it says god loves his faithful servants despite their shortcomings he does not cut us off when we make mistakes nor does he stay resentful and then it puts psalms 103.9 which says he will not always find fault, nor will he stay resentful forever. So why do the Jehovah's Witnesses shun? Why do they disfellowship? It is diabolical to shun someone if they are repentant, right? But so many of us have been victim to this shunning, even if we were repentant. So the next sentence says how important it is for us to imitate our forgiving father. I wish that the governing body would practice what they preach. I wish that they would do this because in my opinion, that is exactly what should be happening. We should not cut 
one another off when we make a mistake. And we should not stay resentful when somebody sins or when somebody makes a mistake. That is their personal relationship with God and they should confess, they should repent. But Jehovah's Witnesses don't do that. So in paragraph seven, of course they never fail to include a good persecution story to nurse their persecution complex. And it's so sad at this point, I am getting sick and tired of seeing this. Just to mention again, the book that I'm reading, the four agreements in this book the second agreement is not to take everything personal and i'm going to read just a couple of sentences from this book because i think it really correlates to how the jehovah's witnesses feel about all these all these persecution fantasies okay so in chapter two of this book on page 48 it says what causes you to be trapped is what we call personal importance Personal importance or taking things personally is the maximum expression of selfishness because we make the assumption that everything is about me. That couldn't be more true of how the Jehovah's Witnesses view themselves. They are always putting these fantasies of persecution in the minds of Jehovah's Witnesses and even with their latest um, picture or video that just came out where all of the government's authorities are looking at this huge screen with the governing body on the screen as if they are being targeted and in this scripture they want to make it seem as if one day you're gonna find yourself in prison and if that happens we will need our brothers and sisters more than ever <laughs> listen if that happens in the united states of america forget about it the world is done because america is one of the you know strongest empires on the planet today that is keeping our foot on the world's neck because we basically police the world okay so if america falls the world falls so if you find yourself in prison in the united states of america as a jehovah's witness i'm sorry but i find that highly highly unlikely in in one of the freest countries in the world because we are literally founded on freedom of religion our founding fathers made that as aspect of our constitution very important because they were being persecuted in england and they wanted to come to this new country so that they can practice their religion the way they wanted so i highly doubt that this persecution would be happening to jehovah's witnesses so that's it for my review on the alternative watchtower study i hope you enjoyed it and i have some new lyrics for song 139 see yourself when all is new and i'll catch you in the next video just see yourself, just see me too. We're deprogramming our minds every day. Think how you feel and how it will be to know the truth about the truth and be free. No evil cults will then prevail the time has come for our new lives to start the song of my praise will pour out from my heart i thank you apostates for all you have done all things are new the fullness of my heart